Now, NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Welcome to NDE Radio with Lee Whitting, whether you're listening on TalkZone, by podcast, through the archives of our ad-free shows on our YouTube channel, or connected through the incredible content of our Facebook page. Robert Christopher Kopis holds a PhD in economics and is a retired banker who has studied near-death experiences for decades. His conviction that NDEs are true spiritual experiences dates back to 1979 after reading Raymond Moody's book, Life After Life, and he lectures on this topic in the U.S. and in Europe. His latest book on NDEs, Impressions of Near-Death Experiences, quotes a broad range of experiencers as tutors for life. Robert is also the author of The Essence of Religions, A Glimpse of Heaven in the Near-Death Experience, and Messages from the Light, also a book called uh, Michael's Cloak, a book about a brother who died of AIDS. Furthermore, Bob is a former president of IONS in the Netherlands and lives in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Bob Kopis, welcome to NDE Radio. Hello, I'm I'm very thrilled that I'm here with you. It's wonderful to 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 be at your show. Well, it's Thank wonderful you. to have you. I, I'm I'm excited, and I've got uh, a whole lots of questions to ask you as a as a fellow researcher into NDEs. Bob, you were raised Catholic, and you've said that as a child you wanted to become a missionary. Do you think that your interest in NDEs is actually fulfilling that aspiration? Actually, yes. I was thinking about that some some time ago, and then I thought, well, what I'm doing actually when I I do my presentations throughout the Netherlands or elsewhere, also in the United States, I think actually I'm trying to to bring out uh, more knowledge on NDEs, and it has to do with the afterlife and how to live here on Earth. I feel a bit like a missionary, but I started out when I was raised Catholic. I wanted to be a missionary for the Roman Catholic Church, but I that's that's long be behind me, I can say. <laughs> yeah. It's broadened now because of all the knowledge that I gained over NDEs. It, that really changes your life. Oh, it does. Bob, why do you think organized religions have shied away from NDEs? Why are they apparently afraid of these testimonies? Since your wish is that NDEs will bring people hope and lead them to more loving lives. Do you think maybe your impressions book uh, lays the basis for a more universal religion than the uh, mainline ones? Well, I I hope not. (laughs) (laughs) I don't hope that it will start another religion because I think it's, uh, you know, the um, religions, the problem with religions is that they are uh, mainly dogmatic. And if you look at NDEs, the thing that that is not there is dogma. It's it's just, the the point that I called my book impressions of near death experiences. I, uh, is because you know if you see one or two NDEs, you don't get the whole thing. It's it's too big, too complicated. Mm-hmm. There, therefore, you need to have more points of view. Uh, it's looking at a, a building. If you look at the building from one side, you don't see the the the, the back side, the, the sides, or the the interior need to have more points of view, and that's what I try to do in my in my book. I, I offer to people to see a lot of NDEs, to see all kinds of different quotes, and then if you do that, if you read through it, you can never be dogmatic. I think because dogmas in churches or in in, in religions uh, uh, are aimed at one point of view. I think, but that's that's somehow how I think of this. Yes. Well, you look at the problems in the world today, especially the what's going on now in Gaza and Israel, and you and know the Ukraine. only and yes, and the Ukraine. But I was going to say, in the especially in Israel, those two people. If you look at the genetic backgrounds, they are entirely of the same background <laughs> genetically, but what divides them is their religion. Judaism versus Islam, and they're at each other's throats over it. Yeah, it makes no you sense. Know, the interesting thing is, if you if you really go into NDEs, the thing you get out of it 
is that love, unconditional love, is the most important thing. Now, what you see in, in that area is a lot of hatred. And I'm not going into where it comes from. It, it all has a, a cause or where there is a reason that it's there. But it's the, the nice thing would be if someone or many people, you can't do that alone, would stop the hatred. Because hatred is, is, uh, pro, uh, is creating hatred over and over again. And it makes your own body and your own mind, it sours everything. It's, it's bad. It's very bad. It, it may even lead to cancer or so, something like that. So a, a hatred should, should really stop. Yes. Well, you've said that unconditional love and interconnectedness are the true nature and basis of reality. So why do we subject ourselves to all the divisions and hostilities of life on earth? And that's a very interesting question. You know, that goes into why are we here on earth? And that's a lot of answers uh, for that. Uh, if you, in my book, I have a, a chapter on uh, why are we on earth? And then there are so many answers. Uh, some say it's for learning. Some say, no, it's not for learning. We know everything. Everything is within us. We have the unconditional love within us because we have uh, the the source within us or God or how do you want to call it? Mm. I'd rather not call it God because then I, I get into religions and the, <laughs> it, it's confined to what religions think uh, God is, but it's the source or the, the, the supreme one or so. So it's already in us. So we don't need to learn anything. We have it in us. We have the love in us. The only thing we need to do is to express that divinity. And that in itself is so difficult because we are born here on earth and we have all these limitations. Uh, we have the dimensions, three dimensions in time. We need to find our food, otherwise we die. Um, we need this, we need that. <laughs> so that those are all the, the limitations that we are in. And that um, disguises uh, the 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 divinity that's within us, but it's there. Mm. We just need to look for it, and that is what uh, a lot of NDEs say. Now, uh, another a lot of NDEs say that it's for learning, um, but there are also interesting uh, uh, quotes from NDEs that say, "Well." Um, it is as if God has gone to the movies. It's um, God, uh, yeah, it's very nice over there where God is, but it's it's kind of maybe dull. <laughs> so uh, God, she or he, it created an environment with limitations. And that's where God itself um, um, comes back in the form of all these humans and all these animals and has to to work with limitations and then try to express the divinity, something like that. So that's that's another point of view that, that some and the ears have. Well, it does carry over to the other side when you get into the question of distressing NDEs. It's been estimated that as many as 20% of NDEs can be terrifying and uh, yeah. Nancy Evans Bush has said that anyone can have a DNDE. Distressing NDEs seem to occur about equally to people of both genders, all ages, education levels, socioeconomic levels, sexual orientations, spiritual beliefs, and religious affiliations. So why is a universe a build of unconditional love offering up distressing NDEs? That's a very good question. That's also the question that uh, Nancy Evans Bush had, and, and she's mm. one of the experts on this. Yes. The point that's very important to mention, and you, you did that mm. already, that uh, a, a minority of the NDEs are distressing. So they are there. We can't just uh, look away from them. So it's not an anom anomaly. It's They are there. Yeah. So then it's difficult to <laughs> study them because... People who have had those uh, don't usually go around saying what that they had it because of the shame, perhaps, that they have. Yes. So we must be very happy and, and, and applaud people who do that. They are very brave that they come out 
uh, and there are a, a few that that did that and uh, wrote books about it, like M.K. McDaniel um, and and also Howard Storm. Yeah. Um, but the, you know, the conclusion that Nancy came to um, is that you cannot say that uh, quote quote um, bad people have only only get distressing NDEs and good people, again, um, these quotes around them, um, get uh, blissful NDEs. So, and that's what she said, that you, anyone could have a distressing NDE, no matter how your life was. And she, in my book, there are, there's a chapter on and uh, distressing NDEs, because if you can't just look away from them, I, I wanted to mention them. And I wanted to have a, a chapter on it. And in this chapter, I give a number of examples of uh, people who have been, so to speak, bad, but have had very nice NDEs and vice versa. Uh, M.K. McDaniel, for instance, is a, a woman that's a regular woman, a very common, uh, normal, nothing uh, wrong with her. I mean, nothing bad with her. Yes. Not especially bad. I mean, everyone is bad <laughs> sometimes, but <laughs> not in a particular way. She doesn't stand out. And she had a distressing NDE. Like she didn't blow up a hotel uh, with 50 people in it uh, just to take out one person. That's what Damien Brinkley did. Mm. Uh, and he had a nice NDE. He had a blissful NDE. So that's... that's uh, uh, that's a problem, and there are so many of these cases that you can say, well, it's, you cannot say that distressing NDEs only occur to bad people and uh, blissful NDEs to good people, even though you, you, <laughs> there's another problem. What is good and bad? Those are words of our earth. As uh, There is a lot of mor morality around it. Um, uh, yeah, so... That that's difficult. Uh, of course, if someone blows up a hotel with fifty people in it, um, well, we can all maybe easily say that that's kind of not very loving, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe bad. But I I shy away from words like bad and good because that's what I've been told by Andy years. Mm -hmm. It's it's um, that doesn't apply to the other side. There is apparently there is. A different notion there's there's no judgment also uh, but so so to come back to the distressing NDEs we we need to find an other explanation for why uh, some people have a distressing NDE and Nancy comes up with uh, the idea that um, uh, when we have when we die and uh, the first phase maybe is still not very uh, um, how do you say that? Not very. Uh, you're not. You're somewhere in between, uh, and then things like uh, uh, images from our collective uh, conscious can still come up, mm -hmm. uh, or from your own experience. Like, for instance, uh, M.K. McDaniel. She had uh, what she said. She had all these judgments around uh, prostitution and AIDS. Now guess what she had in her near death experience in her distressing one she was she was confronted with uh, aids she was given aids she was prostituted she she had all these horrible scenes that she could trace back to her well her beliefs or so so but i think in the end um we all have a good uh, NDE or a, a real if we really die i don't think there is a hell there's there's a few reasons that I think that that's the case. One of them is um, that some NDEs explicitly hear that that there is no hell. Uh, uh, Chris Carlson said, "I was explicitly told there's no hell in purgatory," uh, and another NDE heard, uh, "Well, there is no hell. We all go back home." But the second reason why I think there is no hell is that uh, there's also this notion that in the ears says that we all belong to one big whole. You're all at least interconnected, but probably we are all one. There's only one. So why would one part of 
oneness be in distress. That's, I don't feel that's logical, especially when you hear that there is so much unconditional love on the other side. Perhaps it's because we have this thing we call free will, and we have the free will to reject the oneness if we decide we're not worthy. In other words, we could possibly create our own hell simply by becoming, and I was going to ask you a little later about this, but about who is the judge in a life review. And you were told by, I think, one end of year that on the other side, he was told that the most severe judge is yourself. Yes. So if you decide that you totally are unworthy of the oneness and the love that God is offering, then you can withhold the oneness and isolate yourself, perhaps. Maybe, but eventually, because we are all part of the oneness of a God uh, or the, the source, we cannot stay separate for uh, too long. But actually, I of course, I don't know. No one knows how that actually works. Mm. But it's it's something that we can ponder about. It's it's uh, interesting to think about. But you're right. This this thing about uh, life reviews, uh, where you have your, uh, where you see your life. Uh, passing by there's no one judging you and uh, there is a, a nice story of a, a, a boy scout who was drowned and saw his life review in the presence of an angel and then he asks the angel um i hope i don't i won't be uh, judged too severely and then the angel say says well you are being judged by the most powerful judge there is and then he asks again well when, when will that happen and the, the angel then says to him, well, oh, it's already happened. You're the judge. <laughs> that's the nice thing. <laughs> There's no one no one judging you. That's that's the, It's difficult to explain that to people. I, I, people don't want that. They want someone else to judge them. And then the, the bad people, again, should, should not be allowed in, in this nice area. But why not? Mm. Well, I think the thing about people who have a strong conscience and there's nothing like being raised Catholic to impose something like that on you. The guilt that you can feel, if you're the one judging yourself, that could be not easy at all. It could be terribly hard because you know how far you've fallen at different times in your life, You know how badly you've screwed things up for other people. Even then to think, well, we're all one, so I was really only hurting myself. When the other person is over there crying, in a life review, it doesn't fully explain how you can forgive yourself. So then perhaps it is a purgatory that people go through. Speaking of which, what's your feeling about souls caught in between in a ghostly form? Is that a purgatory on earth? I don't know. It's maybe. But what you said just now is very important, that, that in a life review, uh, you see what you did to others, and if that other is crying, as you said, uh, it's not like you see it from a distance. You, you are that person who is crying. Yes. You yes. are the other person. And that makes me also think that there is no division between you and me, or between me and the one that I do things to. So, And that's also what Daniel Brinkley said when he saw his life review. He said, I saw all my kills. He was a, a killer. <laughs> it's yeah. in the book, so I can say that. Yes. He, he, <laughs> he said that he was a horrible or nasty, I don't know which kind of words he used, but he, he thought of himself as a terrible person. And he said, I experienced all my kills, and not only from the point of view of the people that I killed, but also from the point of view of the wives of those men and the children of those men. Now, that, that the thing that makes you think that is that there is apparently no division because you are that other person. And that, that again, points out to a oneness that is out there. So eventually, uh, and, and he said, I'm the, I was the receiver. He calls it the receiver. So I, I like that word <laughs> because yes. you're both the actor and the receiver. Um so, yeah, some kind of oneness is there. And your question about uh, spirits that are caught in between, hmm. 
I don't know. Uh, um, yeah, I, I hear stories about that, but I'm concentrating on near-death experiences. So uh, those are spirits that come back again. <laughs> yes. And uh, I, I have no um, experience with spirits that uh, stay somewhere in between. There's a priest that participates in some of the IONS conferences who I've had in panel discussions, and that's his specialty. He shows ghosts or trapped spirits or perhaps, I don't know if he thinks of them as being in purgatory or not, but he feels that they're caught. They haven't seen the, their ability and the desire to go into the light, and so he guides them. And he feels he sent a lot of people into the light that were otherwise trapped here. And there's, I think, enough veridical, to use the uh, NDE term, experiences of ghosts in the world that it's beyond question they do exist. I'm going to ask you a theological question. <laughs> Jesus, who many Christians call the Son of God, and who appears personally to many NDEers, whether they're Christian or not, but as I think you pointed out, reportedly with in different appearances. Perhaps some say he's blonde, some say he has dark hair, some say he has blue eyes and others brown and so forth and so on. I've also had ND ears tell me that Jesus can appear simultaneously to thousands of people, dying people or ND ears who are there. In fact, I think the man I'm thinking of experienced speaking to Jesus in one place while he was observing that other people were speaking to Jesus in separate conversations in other places. So are these representations of Jesus simply an extension of the divine that's there to give comfort to people who feel comfortable with Jesus? I wouldn't know, but uh, it could well be. Um, and, and it's interesting what you said. There was a, a conference of IONS where uh, in a panel they had a few people sitting uh, who spoke about their experience in which they saw Jesus, and they all had different descriptions, as you say, brown hair, blonde hair, black hair, the eyes were different, blue, brown, etc. Um, so, but, well, that gives some food for thought of, of why they see different kinds of Jesuses. But, and the other thing is, like you say, some people see them sim him simultaneously, the point is that on the other side, apparently there is seems to be something strange going on with time. Time is there all at the same time or it's not there. So it, if you think of that, then of course someone can, can be in more places at the same time, perhaps. Uh, yes. so, so that is something that is possible. But, but also other deities are seen in... Um, People that uh, are from a Hindu background um, regularly see uh, uh, deities from their religion, like Krishna or uh, Shiva or so, or others that I don't um, that are not so famous. I don't know them. There are I mention a few in my book, also from Islam. So it is there is some cultural coloration of an MDE, um, but in the end. I think there is yeah, this one uh, big uh, source, or I don't know how you call it, but everything comes from it. And, and um, also the, the visions of Jesus come from there, mm. I suppose. Well, you said that every near-death experience is different in the details, because among other reasons, we don't have the language to explain the ineffable. But some NDEers have told me on the show that the entire NDE experience was created to personally serve the personality of that nde -er. For instance, one woman told me that as she walked through a field with her guide, she looked behind them and noticed the scene was disappearing as they walked through it. So she asked her guide, and he said the images were created just for her to make her feel comfortable. Yeah. And maybe that's why every NDE seems different. Yeah. That's also what I understand. I, I know of uh, an nde -er who had a car accident and um, she was an American, but that's not important. <laughs> that's <laughs> a friend of mine in the US. 
And she said, uh, when I was in my NDE, I was hovering in this dark area. There was nothing there, nothing, nothing, except for an abundance of unconditional love. And she floated there and she was so happy and that was wonderful, etc. And then after a while, she thought, well, okay, um, this is nice, but I'd, li I'd like to see <laughs> something. Uh, and then the moment she said it, uh, she said, it was as if a, a giant hand with paint brushes came along and just painted the most wonderful scenes for me with rolling hills and flowers and birds flying overhead and, and, and wonderful uh, uh, little creeks and stuff like that. Everything she wanted to see. So it's you can have something that you like to have. And also perhaps with distressing NDEs, there's a lot of stories that uh, distressing NDEs turn blissful the moment they uh, ask for the light or for Jesus or for God or for mercy or for anything beyond the, the, the distressing thing. There's even one story where a, a guy started meditating, uh, just quieting his his mind uh, or his consciousness. I don't know what you have there. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, it's nothing there. It's it's only your your consciousness, I suppose. So quieting the consciousness, and then everything uh, went quiet and and nicer, and the colors were uh, becoming lighter and brighter, and and everything turned better for him uh, so you have some kind of influence over what what you would like to see and on the that's what you do so that's your initiative but i think on the other side there is also a welcoming committee that's that's how i understand it also and that's more or less how you describe it in this case that you just mentioned that they give something to you that that you like <laughs> Uh, and that's and that's also nice. I mean, if you're a Hindu and you suddenly would see Jesus, um, I don't know if that will be if you wouldn't be scared or surprised or so. I don't think they would like to do that. They will they will give what you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's how it works. They might custom the image of Jesus to fit what most benefits you. In other words. It could be instead of an overwhelming brightness of light, it might be a, just a very human looking Jesus, the way he appears in that series called The Chosen on television these days. And various images of Jesus could be very comforting to some and scary to others. I mean, there have been the Catholic image of the open heart, you know, where his heart is exposed in heaven. And that to some would be very comforting to others would be kind of terrible. But if you say that Jesus appears to Hindu people like the Hindu gods, then that would mean that it is uh, welcoming. It's it's um, no one is left behind. Uh, even uh, people from another religion uh, wouldn't be left a lot, uh, behind. And that's also how I understand uh, NDEs. I mean, you can have an NDE in in whatever situation you are whatever religion you are as you started your uh th this uh radio show i mean it's for everyone it's it's there for everyone no well, matter I... how you are if, if you have a different religion there's no one being angry about that oh absolutely i mean many nd years have come back saying well jesus told me there is no religion in heaven that once you're there it's all the same yeah. I always say uh, the real thing out there, uh, what we can't really wrap our heads around, that thing is much bigger than any one religion on earth. It's mm -hmm. uh, the real thing where the light is, is, is the real thing. And that's yeah. bigger than any religion. I think you broached this in another discussion. Uh, you don't think there's a hierarchy in heaven and yet some indie ears come back saying, well, then this brighter being came and it was Jesus or a brighter being still. And I, I took it to be God as if the degree of brightness of the light differentiates beings such as ancestors you might meet or angels you might meet or Jesus. 
So are there measures of brightness or something else that implies a hierarchy? Well, the, the reason why I said that, that uh, was more that um, we don't know how it actually is on the other side. Mm -hmm. uh, we have some uh, snippets of information. Uh, and as I said, every NDE is different. Uh, some people see reincarnation, some people don't see reincarnation, some people see God, other people see a big uh, oneness. Um, so, and what I said in that presentation is that uh, please don't make a new religion out of NDEs. Okay. Yeah. Because, and that starts with having layers or uh, like uh, you're better than I, or I am better than you are, or things like that. These the discussions, uh, my light is bigger than yours. <laughs> if we start <laughs> discussing in that direction, we are on the wrong track, I think. And that's that's what I try to say. It's, you know, if, if you really look at NDEs, what are the main things that stick out? Of course, unconditional love that, that is said so often, uh, almost in all NDEs, if not in all, uh, but also uh, that we are um, interconnected, at least interconnected, but some people really go further than just interconnectedness. They go further, they say we are one or we are all together, God, uh, things like that. So um, if we are really one or we are very closely interconnected and again if you are in your life review and you see what you did to others as if you are the other then there is no difference between you and me if that is the case and unconditional love is very important then maybe we should change our attitude towards each other uh, in general i speak <laughs> like we we spoke about the war Maybe it would be such a nice thing if, if people in Gaza and in Israel would really understand that uh, unconditional love and, and being interconnected with the other party is the real thing. Mm -hmm. Then they will change their lives or the, their attitude. And another thing that is very important in this respect is why would anyone believe what we say? like uh, love and oneness um, they need proof and the proof is from vertical observations and i think those are underestimated I, there's a wonderful book published by ions the self does not die in which there are hundreds of stories where people have been out of their body and seen things stuff whatever when they were out and they when they came back again they uh they said well i've seen this and that and that could be independently um confirmed mm. but those stories are a kind of uh circumstantial evidence that our consciousness can exist separate from our body that's that's where it starts mm. and that's important i think as a chaplain i encountered a lot of doctors back in the day, especially when I first started, who said, oh, well, that is just a reaction of the dying of the optic nerve or a hallucination of the brain, something that's generated as part of the brain's dying experience. I think a lot of this has come a long way now. I think there has been enough veridical proof, observations, and even prophecy that has come true that it's winning people over. There's a movie now after death that's in some of the major motion picture theaters in, in America, at least, that it just shows that if major theaters are willing to take on movies about NDEs, that things are changing and it is becoming much more accepted, I think, even among medical people. I think so, too, especially I think in your country. A friend of mine had an accident in the U.S. and she was out for a, a bit. And in the hospital, there were medical people asking her, did you experience anything while you were out? And she thought that's an interesting question to ask to someone. <laughs> so uh, apparently there are people in the, in the nursing uh, environment or in, in the medical environment that are open to this more and more so. I was one of them as a chaplain. I would go in whenever someone coded and was resuscitated, I'd go in and say, well, did you see anything when you were on the other side? And about one in 10, I would say, maybe one in 12. Oh, yes. 
I saw my father. He died three years ago, and it was just like I was a little girl, and behind him I saw this beautiful light, and I wanted to run into it, but he said, no, it's not your time yet. And as I tried to run past him, he picked me up in his arms and sent me back. I mean, that kind of story was just so, and they were so happy to talk about it because yeah. I'd asked as if I knew they were going to tell me something. And then I would take a story like that to the next room where somebody was possibly in despair. You know, they were in a terminal cancer situation and the doctor can't do anything more for them. And to tell them a story like that yeah. is so encouraging. It brings so much hope into their It's hearts. so important. Yeah. Oh. It's a very important that people with an NDE come out and tell their story because of these reasons, but also to make uh, it known that it's m more common than people think. Yes. Um, and uh, that's that's another reason why it's so important to get the stories out. Absolutely. Yeah, that was a big reason for starting this show. Let me ask you about something else. It's estimated that about 25% of Christians believe in reincarnation, but after an NDE, about 60% of Christians return with the belief that reincarnation is real, even though they haven't necessarily witnessed anything more than a glimpse of the nature of things. In other words, they haven't seen what, for instance, Plato describes in his story in The Republic about Ur, who goes all the way through to the reincarnation a vision of the reincarnation process. But just the fact that they've come back with the sense that it doesn't stop with one life, does it make you think now that you've been thinking about it that we live more than one life? Reincarnation is a very interesting topic to talk about, but I think we can never really understand what it what it how it really goes because this other area is so different from ours and there's so much to it that we can't see. Mm. So even the word or the concept of reincarnation um, as we know it is, is bound to um, time. Like I had previous lives. Uh, most of the people never have future lives. Um, it's always past lives and then in a sequence going forward. Whereas on the other side, uh, apparently there is no time, um, and then and you know uh, you gave me these uh, statistics, but I understood from uh, Bruce Grayson also that the the percentage of people uh, and the ears that believe in um, reincarnation is not different from what it is in the general American public. So it's hmm. still it's not really clear if it's there it is in, in any case it's not a, a proof and the other thing is that um i, I take the oneness to extremes <laughs> maybe <laughs> too much so but it, you know if you if you think of oneness if we are all one and there is on the other side there's no time or all time is there at the same time then um uh, i don't need to have next lives uh, because the one that has all the lives is the source or uh, the supreme one or a god, if we want to call it. Um, this, this, the god uh, will have uh, been Cleopatra and Napoleon and the fisherwoman on the, the square in front of the Notre Dame or anyone, you and me. So there's no need to have multiple lives because we are we have all lives and, and again i point out at life reviews where you can feel what another felt as if you are the other so there is no difference between you and the others but that that's my thinking in extremes and the only thing that i know and that's what what i then also said on that um presentation in the us uh, at the conference in irons don't make another religion out of it because we need to stick to the, the central themes. The, those are the only thing that reoccur so often. So that's unconditional love and oneness. Um, but, but reincarnation is, is not a, a major theme in NDEs. Uh, neither are levels. Uh, you don't hear all the time that there are levels or um, uh, spirits traveling in packs or so. <laughs> those are things that I think, yeah, you're... you're maybe starting a dogma or so. Hmm. 
but I leave it open to anyone to think differently. I don't tell people what to think. I just give so many quotes from NDEs so people can come to their own conclusion. I've heard it suggested that if time is truly now, that we could be living several lives simultaneously. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, that's what Anita Morjani suggested, that we actually live uh, simultaneous lives. Uh, And that's lives in the past, but also lives in the future. Whereas in the future, that's the problem from our point of view. Uh, We have um, uh, free will. So we have choices. We have actual choices. Uh, so from where we are now, we can't see the future. We can't see how it how it lays out. But on the other side, uh, that's still possible. And um, a friend of mine from the Netherlands, uh, she had an NDE. She said, I asked her, how is it possible that some NDEs can see the future, how, it, how it's going to be, and then it actually occurs like that? So... Is it that it's all predetermined or do we still have free will? And then she says, well, you can picture it as follows, that you are um, on a crossroads and uh, you have the, the, the choice between going left or right. You don't know now what you're going to do, but uh, uh, on the other side, they can see the future as you have chosen, they can see whether you went left or right. And you can picture it as uh, flying in a, an aircraft, she said. If, if you are walking in Amsterdam, where I live, um, you can't see Harlem. Harlem is a city 11 miles away from here. And if you're walking in Harlem, you can't see Amsterdam. But if you're in, in an airplane having a different point of view, then you can see both at the same time. So probably uh, you can, on the other side, you can see from a different point of view, if there's no time, you can see through time, you can see yourself lingering somewhere, thinking, shall I go left or right? But at the same time, you can see which choice you made eventually, either left or right. Well, even in physics, quantum is now telling us that we could choose both left and right simultaneously. (laughs) Yes, yes. That's <laughs> but, interesting. You know, that's interesting that science is going the direction that that they come up with funny quotes that could have been invented by or made by NDEers. Yes. Like this, like what just what you said. It's a premonition of where science is going. Science fiction is like that too. People imagine something and then realize that it's based in reality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love science fiction. <laughs> <laughs> you used the apple and the orange in the talk you gave, but it's possible the apple could be given the chance to experience uh, orangeness as simultaneous with being an apple. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember that, yeah. There's a quote I love, and I can't cite the chapter and verse, but St. Paul says somewhere that we're already seated in the heavenlies. It always conjures up for me a notion that we could be living our life on earth as avatars in a video game, that we're all seated in the heavenlies and we're, we could even be playing more than one video game at a time. Yeah. And I think you had said something about we're just radios playing a source coming from somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, that's Pim van Lommel's quote. Pim van Lommel is a researcher of NDEs. He did this yes. wonderful prospective study on uh, where NDEs come from and came to the conclusion that uh, oxygen, a lack of oxygen or the uh, uh, chemicals in your brain that uh, on the moment of dying don't trigger an an NDE. That's not where they come from. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, he said, it's like um, we are looking at a TV screen and when the TV dies, um, it doesn't mean that the orchestra dies because the orchestra is somewhere else. It's in the studio and the, the, the studio is still there. Or you can see it as a computer. You have your computer is, if it, if it crashes, the information is still in the cloud somewhere. So hopefully. That, yeah, hopefully. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, hopefully. My, my biggest part is also somewhere in the cloud. 
<laughs> but that's that's how people some people see it actually and the the, the um, comparison with avatars that's also very good like the real thing is somewhere else and we are just uh playing this game and and that coincides then perhaps with what i uh, heard and what's in my book by one of the end years they they said well god went to the movies um <laughs> He plays a game. He plays all games. He's mm. he's both you and me and and uh, and and um, Cleopatra and anyone uh, and is just fighting each other and is making is yeah strange to see like that, but has a big laugh up there. Well, I think you said somewhere else that it's not us that reincarnates. If there's reincarnation, it's God that reincarnates. Yes. And you also quoted someone who said, it's God who fills the space in a newborn baby. And it startled me when I heard that, because I thought, if we're all a spark of God, then it's not our souls that we're talking about. We're just a piece of God. That's what I think. Actually, it's uh, the quote that God, it's not us who reincarnate, but it's a God. That's from an end of year. Mm. Uh, and another end of year said, uh, well, when I was... Um, in my NDE, then I saw that I was so free. I left my body and it gives such a freedom, but even my consciousness was going to merge or um, go into this thing that we call the Godhead. So it disappears as well. Uh, and and but that's that's also what you, what you come to a conclusion to if you really think uh, of oneness as in extremes. There's only one, and we can call it God or the source. But the source, uh, if, if a child is born, then something needs to go in it. Uh, and that's there's only one. And that's that's God, uh, mm -hmm. to use that word. Mm -hmm. And if, if that person dies, then the spirit is released again and goes back to where it came from, and that's God. And if a, a next child is born, then the thing... The whole thing goes on again, not necessarily the same part of God. Uh, I don't know how that works, but it's it's you can see it as God that's doing all this. Uh, even the horses and the pets we have, or the lions that are in Africa, all of that is part of God, comes from God. There have been some who've come back who look closely into the light and said that when they looked at what they thought was God, it was billions of souls. In other words, that we are all God and we are all still individuals, apparently, in that light. So I don't know. I've often wondered, you know, we talk about the drop becoming one with the sea, but perhaps we maintain some individuality once we've lived yeah. on Earth. Yeah. You know, I think in the Bible, a nice one of the nice commandments is don't make an image of God because it will always be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> because you can't know how it really is. <laughs> if you are in this limited space with only four dimensions, however are you able to um, to see what the real thing is? You can't. Mm -hmm. And that's that's what I what I really believe. That's why I also say don't make a new religion out of it. it. Just stick with the two things that are important. That's unconditional love and that we are uh, interconnected in a very interesting way that we don't understand. Yes. I like Anita Morjani's, we're all threads in the same tapestry. Yeah. yeah. And same she fabric. said, if you take out one thread, then the whole tapestry that was magnificent loses its beauty. Indy years come back frequently believing that everyone has a task to do on Earth. And you have to wonder what could be so important here that we're missing out on unconditional love and unity. Yeah. We touched on this a little earlier, but you got any last thoughts on why we're here on Earth? That's true. I, that's also what I understand from so many Indy years. We all have a reason to be here. If you don't have reason, you're not here anymore. So mm. then apparently you die. Um, but is and the interesting thing is people sometimes get to see what their uh, mission was or what their reason for being here was uh, whilst being in their NDE 
and once they came back to earth they forgot about it so it's apparently not not meant to be that you understand or that you know what it is because probably you would just rush out the door do it and then hope to die <laughs> something like that i don't know but it's like yeah so we all have a reason no one is unimportant that's also a chapter in my book there's everyone has importance uh it's not only the, the the president of your country or the king in my country or a big celebrity or a singer or so. It's it's also the the people that are on drugs, um, uh, sleeping in the street. They, they are important too. I don't know how that all is, that we are all important, but it's the case. That's what I understand. Well, it may be that we're forced to not remember the reason for our being here simply because it would block what we know as free will. Let's take another look at free will. What does it mean to you? Is it just the free will to choose to be part of the one or not? Or is it a lot more complex than that? There's an interesting story from a, a Dutch woman who was, uh, um, as a child, she was asked to um, to help someone else get rid of some of the lice uh, this other girl had in her hair you know the the horrible animals crawling in your head yes it was just after the world war so we didn't have shampoos then to get rid of them so uh, she did it with a lot of fuss Uh, i'm talking about the end of year so the end of year helped the little other girl lies with a lot of fuss and then she had her nde and the life review and she saw how that played out for the little girl and um she was a little girl and she felt the stabbing in her heart uh and being exposed in such a way to the other school friends and then she said the end of year said well it, that in itself was horrible because i felt the pain she went through but there was something else that was even more horrible and that was the fact that i saw there were options there were other possibilities that i could have chosen but i didn't choose them I chose the one with the, the least love and um, the biggest, the, the choices with the biggest love, I just didn't choose. So there was a free will. And the thing is that with within our limitations, uh, you know, the best thing is to do to choose the options with the, the biggest love. Uh, and, but that's difficult. I mean, if you are born in the Falvella in some other country um, or in your own, I don't know, uh, in, a, in a situation that's uh, not very uh, prosperous and you see people raping each other and killing each other, then that's, that's, an, uh, that's an example that you take as normal. And then you play out your life and do the same stuff. Um, so it's, it's easy to speak from, from our affluent societies or in in the situation we are in we don't know how it is how it is to to play out your free will and then being limited by what you have seen before but that love is so important that's one of the other stories that's uh, christina was a a little girl of eight years old and she drowned uh, because of an assault on her life by two men and um she um, was having a conversation with someone that resembled Santa Claus, she said. (laughs) She was eight, and she said, it couldn't have been anyone else than God. So, But God said, life is very easy. You just have to follow four. uh, There is a recipe for it, and there's four ingredients. Just follow them. It's very easy. And the ingredients were love, be loved, just be and experience life. And I think that having free will, it, the recipe seems easy, but having free will, it's difficult to choose for love and be loved. I think that requires a lot of action from every one of us. Yes. Bob, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts on the importance of NDEs and their significance, not only to the experiencers, but to people who hear these stories and take them to heart the way you have. Tell the listeners how they can learn more about you and where they can find your books and your website. 
Okay, so uh, my book is Impressions of Near-Death Experiences, uh, published by IONS. I'm very happy that IONS did this. Yes, me too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it, it is available on Amazon. People can get it there. And if, if people want to know more about me, they can find me on internet under my shortened name. So my full name is Robert Christopher Copas. But my uh, the website is www.bobcopus, B-O-B, and then C-O-P-P-E-S dot com. And there is also some videos on, on my website uh, with um, some more background, 10-minute videos about uh, distressing NDEs, for instance, or uh, the light, or uh, live reviews, and things like that. And uh, heaven is for all. That's the message. That's what I believe, and that's the message as well. Yes. It was really wonderful to be on your show. And oh, this has been terrific. Very interesting questions and points of view. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. This has been a great discussion. For listeners, if you'd like to hear the show again, or any of our more than 500 archived ad-free NDE interviews, go to TalkZone's NDE radio site and hit the Past Shows button, or go to our YouTube channel, NDE Radio with Lee Whitting, where you can subscribe to and comment on the complete NDE Radio Library. And be sure to check out our NDE Radio Facebook page. Just search NDE Radio with Lee Whitting on your Facebook app. And listen again next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern at Talk Zone for more NDE Radio. I'm your host, Lee Whitting, saying thanks for listening. <laughs>